Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Three Down Nation podcast. And boys, today we have to start with a shout out to Danny from Regina, who works with our good buddy and colleague at ThreeDownNation.com, Brendan McGuire. And one of the things that I learned from him is he has a real dislike for not just John Hodge, but also J.C. Abbott. What? what do you two have to say for yourselves in terms of Hodge, your disparaging remarks about the city of Regina, and J.C. Abbott, your continued hate of his beloved Saskatchewan Rough Riders? I, my continued hate of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders? Are strong words. Wow. Oh, I, I I don't I don't think I've said anything particularly disparaging of Regina on this podcast. I've I've been to Regina multiple times. Um, there are parts of Regina that are very reminiscent of my home city of Winnipeg, which is also uh, let's call a spade a spade not the most glamorous destination in Canada. Um, so I I would reject that notion. But shout out Danny for listening to the show. Hey, I I don't think I'm particularly disparaging of the Rough Riders. I have, however, yeah, you're the one who said I've, I've awful said, things about I've Regina. I've said some nasty things about Regina, and you know what? To be fair, I call it the butthole of the nation. Oh but my buttholes God. have <laughs> buttholes Jeez. have more topographical variation than the city of Regina. So, um, <laughs> it, it, ouch! It's uh, it's something I'm going to stand by. Uh, it's Danny, Danny from Regina. Yep. Yeah, well, in, enjoy freezing to death in the winter, Danny. Uh, I'll just keep soaking up uh, the the ocean views outside my front door. You know, I was out there in mid-April, obviously, fellas, for the announcement of being the Rough Riders pre- and post-game host on CKRM, the live stream that we're going to do. And it was beautiful. And you know what they call it out there, fellas? God's country. And there's something, I think, to be said for that overall. There are some beautiful areas there. And that it probably is under the radar in terms of the disrespect it gets from JC. I'm not even going to repeat that statement or that word you used to describe it because the people there are very welcoming. And especially when they the weather are. is nice there, I'm not going to sit here and talk about, you know, wanting to endure those long, cold winters that they have. But in the summer, in the fall, and even the spring, when the weather's nice, there's a great feel around there. So, you guys got to remember here that Danny watches and listens to every single episode. He's a dedicated Rough Riders fan. So shout out to Danny for him sticking with us through thick and thin, even though he doesn't like a couple, maybe even all three of us on the podcast, because it was hard to get him to smile. But <laughs> those are the kind of people that we like. For the uninitiated, this is what happened. I, I'll also say, this is not like like we should not conflate Regina with Saskatchewan. Regina mm -hmm. at the end of the day is like 10 percent or, or just over the percent of the population of Saskatchewan. I think Saskatoon is beautiful. I think that Moose Jaw is beautiful. And yeah, I like the province of Saskatchewan as a whole. So don't conflate Saskatchewan with Regina. The only time that those two things kind of intersect is the CFL because, of course, the riders are Saskatchewan's team, not just Regina's team. But yeah, like like Regina to be it would would not be on my top ten list of of places to visit in the province of Saskatchewan. That's, but but again, I don't think I've ever said anything that nasty about Regina on the show. I I will say we say a lot of things tongue in cheek. I've got to be the West Coast boy here. To your point, Dunk. Great people in Saskatchewan. All the Riders fans I've met have been fantastic. And Danny has one thing over me, and that's probably that he lives in a in a nice house that he's you know close to paying off, and I will never ever own a home <laughs> because I live in Vancouver. Uh, you never know what can happen, but appreciate you humoring me, boys. And just like Danny, all the rest of our loyal readers, listeners, and viewers, we appreciate y'all and keep coming back to the Three Donation Podcast and Three Donation. Dot com. Today, we're discussing Jeremy O'Day's comments on the possibility of signing Canadian receiver Chase Claypool. An update on the devastating injury suffered by Jack Hinsberger during the West semifinal. The Montreal Alouettes getting ready to roll out a throwback uniform. Marshawn Lynch attending an NHL game in the peg. Maybe Winnipeg is a destination city, Hodge. 
<laughs> and an intriguing potential addition to the 2024 CFL draft. But first, Canadian quarterback Nathan Rourke took to social media to criticize the CFL and Toronto Argonauts for their handling of the lawsuit facing reigning league MLP Chad Kelly and the Boatman franchise. Quote, I'm disappointed with the lack of urgency expressed by both the CFL and the Toronto Argos. This issue must be viewed with the utmost seriousness and concern for the truth. What example are we setting for boys and girls across Canada if we can't practice what we preach, close quote. Mm -hmm. The comment was made in response to a report from Sportsnet's Arash Madani that some female staff at the CFL head office had resigned over concerns with how Commissioner Randy Ambrosi and other senior league staff were handling the situation. What do you guys make of Rourke's comments? Well, I appreciate Rourke speaking out. I think Rourke is kind of uniquely situated to speak out on this as somebody who is not currently in the CFL or under contract with the CFL team, but also has the eyes and ears, right, of CFL fans as somebody who took the league by storm somewhat recently, but is, of course, now in the NFL. And I will also say, when it comes to these allegations that are that have, that have been levied against Chad Kelly. I think there are some people in his camp who took these comments a little bit personally um, and were a little bit upset that we ran with them. I should also note that multiple other news organizations ran with this statement from Nathan Rourke. CFL.ca did not pick it up. I wonder why. But a lot of other news organizations did. And when it comes to Rourke's statement, he is not talking about Chad Kelly here. He is criticizing the CFL and the Toronto Argonauts. So when you look at the past precedent, when it comes to allegations, again, not things that have been proven in court, tested in court, nothing that has been proven as fact, just just allegations. There are several instances where players have been immediately cut by their teams and or barred from the league as a whole for being the subject of allegations. If you look at somebody like Jerome Messam, you look at somebody like Jalen Saunders, somebody like Nate Hawley, these are people who some cases were charged, but in some cases were not charged with any criminal wrongdoing, but was were merely the subject of an allegation and were sent packing within 24 hours of those allegations surfacing. Now, this is a little bit of a different situation because, of course, the allegations stem from workplace setting, right? This wasn't like a player went out one night on a Saturday night and was socializing and allegations arose from something that happened away from the team. This is something that happened allegedly in Toronto's facilities in front of several other Argonauts employees. Um, and I think at the end of the day, this is something that, as we discussed when the, the news of the lawsuit broke, this is something that the league should have addressed quicker. And I think that one change they could have done differently in hindsight is moving Chad Kelly to the suspended list or to some type of commissioner's exempt list like they have in the NFL just to make some type of motion. If the Argos aren't going to cut him and the, the, the CFL isn't going to pressure Toronto to chuck him out of the league, because let's let's be fully honest, the CFL, I'm sure, behind closed doors, desperately does not want to throw away the star quarterback of the Toronto Argonauts, who's filling BMO Field and was just named the MOP of the league. But by placing him on a suspended list or a commissioner's exempt list, like again, they have in the NFL, they could be taking an intermediary step to saying, hey, we're doing our own investigation, but in the meantime, we're not going to allow Chad to engage in team facilities. We're not going to allow him to uh, to, to necessarily have the full uh, specter available to him of what a normal player might have in the off season. So again, we don't know the status of the review the CFL is doing. We don't have a timeline. We don't have any of that. But when it comes to Rourke's statement, I get where he's coming from because I do think one can argue that the CFL and the Argos were slow on the uptake here. Yeah, a, a suspension like you're describing, Hodge, would mostly be symbolic at this point of the year, but symbols are important, right? And it would be meaningful – to people around the league to see some action being done because without any change to the situation of Chad Kelly, it feels a lot like inaction, even if things are quietly being done behind the scene. We've, we've talked at length about a number of aspects of this case. There's two things about this tweet that really jump out to me. First, 
Nathan Rourke speaking out. This is the first time we've really seen a prominent player voice speak about this situation. And as you know, Greg Hodge, Rourke is uniquely situated being in the NFL to make these comments. But I've been struck throughout this process, guys, by the lack of of commentary from other people in the league about what's happened. And we don't know what the instructions were to members of the Argos or members of other organizations. But it's pretty typical if you look when situations like this arise in the NFL to have teammates or people come to a player's defense, uh, either say it outright or make inferences on social media to back their boy as we would say that hasn't really happened in this case. And I think if you look at maybe some of the people who were liking or sharing what Nathan Rourke said, there is some uh, discontent within the league, even among players about how this situation has been handled with Chad Kelly, likely because this situation is being handled differently than it has with other guys who they may have personal relationships with with as well and it's clear that maybe it's not favoritism but the league is taking this particularly cautiously the other aspect i think is worth discussing is is the fact that this particular story has really highlighted the discontent of fans as well because as you guys know we look at the numbers on the site and after the first revelations Uh, of these allegations, the numbers for Chad Kelly related articles have been solid, but not eye popping by any stretch of the imagination until these Nathan Rourke comments. This really went over the top. And I think that speaks to a level of discontent from fans who are tired of hearing about this story in the context of something that hasn't been resolved and are expressing through what they're clicking on and what they're reading, that they agree with Rourke here, that they are also disappointed in a lack of urgency, and they'd like something to happen here. Let's just quickly go over the facts for anyone who's getting caught up with this, okay? A former strength and conditioning coach with the Toronto Argonauts, along with her lawyers, filed a statement of claim on February 21st. With these allegations, that makes them factual. The Argos then filed a intent to defend on February 27th. That is their right in a civil situation. Chad Kelly filed a very similar intent to defend on March 13th. So this case is ongoing. We have, to the best of our ability, fellas, I believe so far, presented the absolute facts of this case. The facts are allegations, a number of them, have been made by this former strength and conditioning coach. The other facts are the Argos and Chad Kelly have filed intents to defend. And I would imagine, as we've been told and are led to believe, even though I don't really like that statement, the statement of defense is going to come at some point from Chad Kelly for him to, I suppose, tell his side of the story as this case progresses. We will do the best job as we stay balanced in this case to cover the facts. We asked the league, JC, full credit to you for pushing for this, how they were going to go about this process. There's an independent investigation that is underway from the league's perspective. They put up no guardrails for that. And I've been told that there have been players from the Argonauts that have been part of the depositions, let's call it, through this independent investigator, which could help the league formulate some type of discipline or no discipline at all. They are trying to find the truth here. I can understand where Nathan Rourke is coming from in terms of the speediness. He would like to see some action taken more quickly, but in reality, the league is going to follow the lead of their lawyers. Same for the Toronto Argonauts. Same for the former strength and conditioning coach, same for Chad Kelly as well. So it might take a little longer than all of us want, but I do really get the sense here from all sides, excuse me, and most importantly, the league side, that the due process here is going about in a way that should help us find the truth, which is ultimately what will tell us everything that we need to know. 
Well, and Kelly's lawyers, as we talked about on the show recently after we got this statement, have said that they don't believe these claims have any merit. And Kelly himself on March 1st tweeted a statement saying he was shocked by the allegations and he absolutely denied that the events uh, that were alleged took place. So we have also covered that side of the story from Mr. Kelly. Um, the thing that I think is is the problem here is that up until now, whether it was intended or unintended, the standard at which the CFL set the bar was if you're accused of something that we don't like, you're out, right? You're gone. Mm-hmm. And that was not followed in this situation. And one can argue that that was that never should have been the precedent, right? That people should have got more time, more patience, more due process. But the issue of favoritism or the issue that I think has rubbed some fans the wrong way and has talked to people in the league the wrong way, talking to obviously not the staff in Toronto, but talking to personnel people or coaches or players and other teams, they seem very upset that in the past, maybe they had to release a player because of an allegation and suddenly it's being treated differently this time. So I think that's where the frustration comes from. I think they're, they're, I think, you know, the accusations of some hypocrisy there maybe do have merit because when you're a back end special teams player or a guy who's in their, you know, mid late thirties and might be over the hill, it's easy to get rid of you. When you're the face of the league, you're not treated with that same standard. Should, should everybody be treated the same way? Yes, everybody should be treated the same way. Does that ever actually happen in real life? Uh, doubtful, right? Depending on the person you are and the, the status that you have, sometimes it's the wealth that you have, and a number of different factors about any given person, you will be treated a certain way uh, than, than other people might, right? And so I think that is part of the frustration that Nathan was getting towards, and I think that we've seen from a lot of feedback from fans saying, hey, the precedent was X, why is Chad Kelly getting Y? Right. That, I think, is a, is a big source of the frustration. And moving forward, I think the league would be wise to develop. Uh, and, I, and we know that they have the domestic violence policy, but maybe there should be a clearer policy for what happens in the instance that a player is the subject of allegations, be it domestic violence or something else. Um, and that way we could have a more level playing field when it comes to these types of situations because nobody wants to rush to the judgment of whether somebody's innocent or guilty. However, I do think it's important that people are given an even and fair playing field and we don't see some guys stick around the league with no consequences. I'm not saying that's going to happen in this case, but it appears that's a possibility and other guys get chucked out the next day, never to be heard from again. And let's let's be frank here, guys. I think Chad Kelly himself has squandered maybe whatever goodwill he had in this scenario. Because you're talking about a guy who was immensely popular with fans coming out of the season. But even before these allegations with some of the ways he handled coming out with his concussion after the East final loss and then post-allegations – the way he's handled himself publicly in the online space, it's rubbed some people the wrong way, right? And it's not something we like to talk about a bunch because it has really nothing to do with the allegations themselves. It's not substantial. But if Chad Kelly was a good soldier who was out there towing the company line and and just simply saying, you know, these are not true and I'm going to let my lawyers speak for me and not saying anything else except that maybe people are viewing him in a different lens but because he occasionally makes some off the wall tweets because he's on instagram live looking like he may be intoxicated at times this is a guy that people don't really trust that he's handling this situation the right way right now and again that has nothing to do with what came before it's entirely possible that he could act like that and the allegations are entirely unfounded but from a public optics perspective i don't think he's handled himself particularly well with the spotlight on him right now and that has troubled the league and it has troubled fans who are watching him you could argue that chad kelly has violated the league's social media policy i'll give him some free advice Stop posting on social media, Mm -hmm. Chad Kelly. Simple and easy. Your agent should have told you this. Your lawyers should have told you this. 
stop posting on social media until this case has reached a conclusion and handle whatever that conclusion is like a gentleman. Because to be quite honest, fellas, as you all know, there are a lot of people watching his every move, including those at the head office who have the ability to not register your contract or ban you for the rest of your life. And the Canadian Football League has given you an opportunity to earn a pretty healthy living playing football when there was no other pro league out there that was going to do so. So let's remember that. And I think it should be said, guys, that on the flip side of this, as Chad Kelly was having a dominant MOP type season, we were speaking those facts as well. I think that gets forgotten by a lot of people, especially close to Chad Kelly, when this situation has arised now with allegations filed to the Ontario Superior Court of Justice, that when Chad Kelly was on his way up, when Chad Kelly was helping the Argos win a Grey Cup coming off the bench after McLeod Bethel Thompson had a hand injury, that he was universally being praised. And he earned that praise on the field in 2022 and 2023. But he needs to understand that he needs to deal with being an elevated star now You're in a much different light. The microscope is bigger, especially, and some people might laugh, but on a professional team that is with Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment in Toronto. As much as the Argonauts, some people will talk about, you know, their fans not showing up or the fan base not being as big as it should be, that East Final looked pretty packed. So he owes it to his fans. He owes it to the CFL who gave him arguably his last chance to succeed in professional football to treat this case with the respect it deserves, regardless of the outcome, and also to stay off social media, please, until there's a resolution. I feel like that's probably good advice for everybody. Just stay off social media. It's it's pretty pretty good advice, actually. Um, Let's move on, boys. Canadian linebacker Jack Hinsberger took to social media to announce he suffered a severe brachial plexus injury during the West semifinal when he collided with Peyton Logan of the Calgary Stampeders, an injury that is likely career ending. Hinsberger lost consciousness momentarily and was unable to use his right arm before undergoing surgery to reconstruct the path of his nerves, which has returned partial use of the limb. He indicated that his recovery process will take two and a half years, though he doesn't believe his arm will ever fully heal. JC, what do you make of Hinsperger's announcement? You know, it's, it's clearly very sad to see a guy suffer a, an injury of this magnitude and, and somebody have their career likely end, especially so early in their career. But I, I'm... I think Hinsberger is handling it as well as anyone possibly could. And I love that he's sharing his story with fans and sharing his rehab to give everyone a glimpse at what players like him go through. Clearly, this has been a hot button topic uh, this offseason. I know it has sparked a lot of conversation about changes to the kickoff rules and things of that nature. I think reasonable people can disagree about that, but clearly nobody ever wants to see an injury of this magnitude um, to a player like Kinsberger. I mean, shades of of the Jonathan Hefney situation in terms of the injury to his arm. It looks like he has avoided the worst possible scenarios, but we wish him the best in terms of his very long road to recovery. Man, it's just tough to hear and difficult to think about the use of a limb potentially not coming all the way back for Hinsberger after this horrific hit and subsequent injury that he's had to deal with. Full credit to him for being open about this rehab process that he's about to go through and already has started going through. I think that is commendable because a lot of people, you know, you see these guys put the helmet and shoulder pads and uniform on and go out there playing game day and sometimes we just think of professional athletes as robots but no these are going to be long lasting effects for Hinsberger's entire life that he's going to have to fight and claw and scrape through just to potentially get back the full use 
of all of his limbs, and in particular, the one limb that was majorly damaged from a nerve perspective with this hit. So full respect to him, hate to see it. And, you know, we're usually not allowed to cheer in the media, so I hesitate to say this, but I think everybody across Canada, any fan of the CFL and us covering the league from a reporting perspective would like to see him get back to full health. So we're cheering you on and hope you get there one day. I think that's well said, boys. And I, I kind of don't like that this story has become about kickoffs in the CFL because to me, this story is about Jack Hinsberger. Mm. This is a guy who was a late seventh round pick in last year's CFL draft, was most mostly on PR last year, right? Biding his time and then got an opportunity to get into some games late in the year. Like this was a guy who probably, you know, after working his tail off at the University of Waterloo, had, you know, a, a decent career ahead of him as a special team or maybe eventually a, a rotational defensive guy. But, you know, one of those great heart and soul glue guys that that every CFL team needs. And his career has been shortened to six games plus plus, you know, a, a brief time in the playoffs. And obviously it should also be noted that that Peyton Logan suffered a serious injury as a result of this hit. Um can we talk about the kickoffs? Yes. I, I will point out that, you know, the, the Jonathan Hefney that you mentioned, JC, was a defensive play. DeMar Hamlin's injury mm-hmm. in the NFL from, I believe it was just last season. That was a defensive play. Like, like yes, it's horrible what happened to Hinsberger and Logan. I, I also, I, 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 don't, I don't necessarily think, at least from a cursory view of it, from the outsider's perspective of somebody who just watches the games, I don't see special teams being a huge, huge risk factor for injuries. And if there is data that the league or the CFLPA could produce to indicate that, I would love to see it. Thus far, they've done nothing. They've just leaked this information to TSM that, hey, we might be changing kickoffs. And um, personally, I, I, I wish that we'd, we'd been given a little bit more information through more formal streams about, hey, this is where the injuries take place. This is why we want to make that change. I'm not for or against the change, but I do think that it's a shame that this story has largely been about how the CFL should handle kickoffs in the future when it should be more about Jack Hinsberger. And for that reason, as much as we just condemned social media in our last segment, I'm thrilled that Jack is on social media sharing this information. And he has said that he wants to use this new account that he's created to kind of chronicle his recovery and to hold himself accountable. Because, boys, I, I don't like my mother was an occupational therapist for 25 years. This guy is going to be going through a lot of pain and misery over the next two and a half years to try to get his body back to a place where it can function well for the rest of his life. And uh, he's going to need all the love and support that he can get. So if you're listening to the show, please do what I've done. Go ahead, follow Jack Hinsberger and uh, and give him that support because this is not about football at this point. This is about Jack Hinsberger and his life that is ahead of him. Hopefully he can make as close to a full recovery as possible. The last thing I'll say on this particular topic is you can do lip service to player safety by changing rules like this. You can potentially avoid a freak injury of this nature by simply not having that play in the game. That's all well and good. You can have that discussion. But if you really care about player safety and player health, you've got to make sure that these players are covered medically for life. And I know there have been strides in the recent CBA in terms of the quality and the length of their coverage. But in my mind, if a player like Jack Hinsberger goes out there on the field and has an injury of this nature where 20, 25 years down the line, he's got something going on with that arm because of a foot that uh, a hit that happened on the football field, it is ethically and morally the responsibility of the Canadian Football League to ensure that he has access to the medical care he needs regardless of the situation. That is not the case at that stage now. And frankly, as we take these little steps forward, until you do that, until you're willing to commit to taking care of your players until death, then I don't think you can really confidently say you care about player health and safety at all in my mind. 
Dunk, you got the chance to ask Saskatchewan Rough Riders GM Jeremy O'Day about his team's decision to add Canadian receiver Chase Claypool to its exclusive negotiation list. After talking to him, do you feel it's more or less likely that Claypool will sign a CFL contract in the future? I still think it falls in the less likely category, but full credit to Jeremy O'Day for being open about this. Usually coaches and personnel people and general managers in this league are hesitant to talk about players on their negotiation list, but O'Day was up front and saying that they haven't had any discussion with Claypool or his representation to date, but they would very much love to was the direct word love from O'Day. So I think that if you have that kind of want to from one side that as Claypool's career goes along here, we'll see what happens next. He had a visit, I believe it was that same day that I asked O'Day the question last Wednesday, would that be April 10th to the Seattle Seahawks may or may not be a potential there with that team. There may or may not be a potential to sign a contract elsewhere in the NFL. And as O'Day pointed out, guys come on and off the negotiation list all the time. And it kind of becomes a bit of a, timing thing a guy as he made an example to he didn't use any names but might say he's never going to play in the cfl or never going to come up there and a year later completely changes his mind and then comes north of the border so claypool has made you know a good amount of money in the nfl i believe it's over eight million if i remember right usd so he probably doesn't need to from a financial perspective and jc you talked about this before if claypool can't get motivated for millions of dollars in the nfl how could he get motivated for potentially a hundred thousand and change or two hundred thousand in the CFL if he even got that money up front? That question would need to certainly be answered, but there is an actual real desire there from the Rough Riders to at least have that conversation. And credit to you, Dunk, for getting O'Day to go on the record about it, right? You're not wrong. Teams don't like talking about their Nagless players publicly. Why? I have literally no idea. This seems like a really great opportunity to get the CFL out there during the off season. But yeah, for whatever reason, teams don't like talking about big name guys. They've added to the neg list. Maybe it's because they feel like they'll have egg on their face. If a guy never signs, but I don't think anybody in Ryder Nation is going to say, Oh, that Jeremy O'Day wasted our time because he put chase Claypool on the neg list and they never managed to sign him like no I think the reaction from Ryder Nation even if they never sign the receiver which I agree is still a, a long shot is hey nothing ventured nothing gained it, it's it's great that we're going out there and turning over every stone because we know that the BC Lions had chase on their negotiation list shortly after the 2020 CFL draft when Claypool was available but did not get selected and they dropped him. So imagine the coup for Ryderville if they were able to scoop Chase Claypool away from his hometown CFL team just on the off chance, just on the off chance he ever signs in the CFL. I think that'd be great. So kudos to you. And for all the CFL personnel people listening, please start talking about your negligence players. This, I feel like this is positive for everybody. Let's be entirely frank. There was one reason and one reason only that Jeremy O'Day was happy to talk about Chase Claypool being on his neg list. And that's because the reason everyone knows that he's on their neg list is because the Saskatchewan Rough Riders wanted that out there because it's great publicity for the brand. This is all part of the plan. Obviously, it's luck of the draw here, whether you get Chase, uh, Chase Claypool to come up to Canada as O'Day mentioned, if you get the timing right, it's a coup. I don't see it happening. And to be frank, I'm sure the next time we get our hands on a neg list, I doubt Chase Claypool is going to be on it for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders or for any other team. Let's get one thing right, that Claypool has a connection to Saskatchewan. His mom, Jasmine, is from the province out there. So I don't know if we can say the BC Lions are necessarily – his only hometown team, so to speak. Okay. Yes, it is. That's where his home is. Yeah, but Come I mean, on he's now. got ties to that province, and Ryder Nation yeah, loves he, anybody that has his ties mom's to Saskatchewan. From there. You you don't get get to retroactively move somebody's hometown based on where their parents are from. Welcome like, to the CFL not... draft. We do it all the time, bro. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
And I, I take issue with this. Like we and going back, we talked about Nathan Rourke off the top. Every time we write an article that I'm not writing, you guys say native of Victoria, BC. The kid grew up in Oakville. Just because he was born in Victoria doesn't make it his hometown. You, can you get both? Can you look, right? it's, can it's you look up you the definition up. of the word native? I'm pretty sure it means someone who's from there. So he's from Victoria, <sighs> BC. Victoria born, Oakville raised. How about that, JC? Hey, uh, that's an accurate statement. I just, the, all those coaches in Oakville minor league, all the people who put in time to make R- Nathan Rourke the person he is, they deserve that. That's what hometowns are for, right? To notify like you as to where this person comes from, where they were developed, all the people in the community that shaped them. Just because you were born somewhere or a parent was born somewhere, that doesn't make it your hometown. Where's it's your where hometown, from. JC? It's where your feet were. It's Where's where your you hometown? went to school. My, home t- my hometown is here. You were born in Edmonton. I'm, when did you was move? Born in, mm-hmm. I was when'd born in move? Edmonton, right? I I moved in the third grade. So you, so you spent nine years somewhere, and you're like, eh, none of those people who, I, who were my Actually, teachers and classmates. I didn't spend friend, the whole nine uh, years uh, in uh, Edmonton None of them are either. important. I'm just, I'm just from <laughs> I White also Rock. spent some of that in Montreal. Okay. So it's almost like you're saying that maybe by declaring somebody is a native of a particular country, city, province, whatever, maybe that in and of itself isn't a large overview of everything they did before the age that they are now. And maybe it's just a generalization because that's what it is. It is a yeah. generalization and it's a generalization that well, one day when I write much. an article Let's about you, about I will be very sure to write Abbott, <laughs> who was born in Edmonton and spent an unclear mm-hmm. period of time in Montreal before moving to White Rock, <laughs> British Columbia at the age of nine, comma, and then I'll continue the article. Thank you, Hodge. That would be much but, uh, appreciated. Hey, well, could you I, can have multiple could I get, homes, Could guys? I get an itinerary on your vacations too? Because if you spend a week in Mexico, I don't want to miss that. <laughs> I don't want to be. I, I can't. I can't do any Disney World erasure. Do you go to Disney World? Hey, I, all I'm saying is, if I did was you a go on into Small player, World? Like I, I want to note enough- that too. <laughs> <laughs> if I was playing in the pros, right, as a football player, I would want it to be noted that I was from White Rock because that's where I played my community ball. That's where I played my high school ball. That's where I was developed as a player. None of that happened in Edmonton. Absolutely zero, right? None of that happened in Montreal. I'm from White Rock. That's where I spent the majority of my time. That's where the formative years of my development took place. That is my hometown. As much as I love Edmonton, I have ties to the sports teams. and That's where my parents are from. My hometown is White Rock, B.C. Let's say Claypool has ties to Saskatchewan then, just to make you happy, JC. Thank you, Doc. Hodge, you reported that a player who was once one of the top recruited high school athletes in the United States could qualify for the 2024 CFL draft following a unique collegiate career. Tell us about it. Antonio Alfano, six foot four, 285 pounds, coming out of high school in New Jersey was the fifth-ranked prospect in the entire United States for colleges looking to fill their ranks. And he had a ton of offers, ended up being the number one recruit to some little uh, uh, under-the-radar football school called the University of Alabama. Um, And unfortunately, things did not go very well for him with the Crimson Tide. He never suited up for the team. Nick Saban, legendary coach who recently retired, accused him of quitting on the team. Uh, He then transferred to the University of Colorado, got suspended there for violating team rules, and ultimately never ended up playing, though he was eventually reinstated by the Buffaloes. Now, there are some legitimate reasons, I think, for Alfano's kind of nomadic start to his collegiate career. He was diagnosed with epilepsy and was having seizures at one point, which is obviously an extremely serious medical issue. He also, uh, at one point, his father came out on social media indicating that his grandmother had fallen into ill health. Um, obviously, that could potentially take a toll on Alfano's uh, you know, mental health, um, you know, bereavement, that kind of stuff is obviously to be taken seriously as well. But it should be noted that after Cincinnati, Alabama and Colorado, he transferred to Independence Community College in Kansas and again, never played and then sat out all of 2022 before finally seeing the field in 2023 at Lackawanna College uh, of the Nash- National Junior Collegiate 
Athletic Association. Only played five games, but was a beast there. Eight tackles for loss, four sacks. And that garnered him a whole brand new set of offers from a bunch of top programs, including USC, Oregon, Auburn, Tennessee, a whole bunch. Now, he decided to forego those and declare for the NFL draft. Now, why is this relevant for CFL fans? The answer is because recently it was learned that Alfano's mother was born in Toronto. And though he does not currently have his Canadian citizenship, he could. And he is very much on the radar of CFL teams. Rick Ciratella, who was recently hired as a scout by the Edmonton Elks, was at the Pro Day for Alfano in New Jersey. It was held last week. He is not as heavy as he once was. He is now weighing a little over 250 pounds, so maybe more of an edge guy than an interior guy. But this is a player, just, just to give you an example of the guys he was ranked ahead of, ahead of the collegiate ranks, he was ranked ahead of guys like Garrett Wilson, Evan Neal, Trevon Walker, George Pickens, Charles Cross, like all guys who are now high profile NFL players, many of them very high draft picks, including Walker, who's the first overall pick a couple of years ago to the Jacksonville Jaguars. Among those ranked ahead of him were Derek Stingley, Jr., Nolan Smith, and Kayvon Thibodeau, again, all of whom were first round picks, including Stingley, I think was a th- third overall and Thibodeau is a fifth overall. So Mm -hmm. again, I'm not saying Alfano's on the level with those guys right now, but what I am saying is he was once on their level. This is a guy who had unbelievably uh, or, or, or was unbelievably sought after coming out of high school. And the CFL in the past has been a place for people to come up and rejuvenate their professional careers, right? And kind of rewrite their story. And it makes you wonder if at some point, Alfano will get that opportunity in the CFL because he could not only do so as an American player, he could, of course, do it as a Canadian player, which would potentially give him a bit of a longer runway given the league's rules surrounding surrounding its 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 roster construction. Yeah, I mean, this is a fascinating story. The prospect of a player who was this caliber of recruit coming to the CFL and essentially, I would think, using it as a launch pad similar to like what Quantez Stiggers done uh, ha- has done in terms of not playing very much at the collegiate level or not at all in Stiggers case and using the CFL as the spot where he can showcase himself. I think there's potential for Alfano to do that in Canada. Um, like you mentioned, Hodge, there's all sorts of factors that play into why he didn't play very much. I think there's also a possibility that he's just not a school guy. And that's one of the things I've always hated about the American system as opposed to the Canadian system, if I can to our own horn slightly, is that in the States, if you're not a student athlete, there's not really that opportunity for you to play high level football. But dude, really, how many of frank, these guys are true student athletes in the States? <laughs> well, high let, level let, guys. That, Come on, man. That's Basket fair enough, weaving, dancing but that's, classes. That's, that's a bad system, right? You, you shouldn't have to take an academic degree to be a football I agree. player. I'm right? just if saying. you want to be a plumber, if you want to be an electrician, if your future is as a truck driver, you shouldn't have to take a basket weaving degree or have to do well in that academic setting to get on the field. It's great for guys. I love student athletes. I love collegiate sports. I think it's great for people to get degrees. It's not for everybody. And that's why I'm often very thankful that in Canada, we have the Canadian Junior Football League where guys can go and pursue those things and also play decently high-level football with a path to the pros for guys like Andrew Harris. That tangent aside, this is a fascinating story, and it's something that fans need to be aware of, not just for this draft, but if Alfano does not meet the CFL's deadline, we have the potential here for a supplemental draft before the season, which we see from time to time which is a draft held for just a small number of players, one or two, where teams can essentially bid draft picks for next year for a player 
this year. And the interesting thing about that, gentlemen, as you both well know, is it maintains the draft order from the previous year. So the Edmonton Elks would have the right of first refusal, essentially. They have the top pick in that supplemental, just like they have the top pick in this draft. And it would appear that with Saratella there, not only at the program, but I believe he was one of the people who helped organize it, they've got a personal connection with Alfano, who is maybe dragging his feet a little bit, so to speak, in terms of getting his citizenships. Now, we wouldn't on this podcast accuse Chris Jones of any wrongdoing. He is a, a man with a sterling reputation who has never bent the rules at all. But there is a possibility here that if Alfano gets his citizenship after the deadline for this draft, that the Elks would have the right to get him with whatever pick they wanted in the supplemental. So that is a possibility that's coming down the line, something that fans should keep their eye on. Great scoop on this, Hodge. A really intriguing athlete, and it's the kind of stuff that we continue to bring you at 3 com. Yes, we have some fun from time to time and do posts like Marshawn Lynch and laugh on the podcast, but we're about the facts, fellas, and the fact is – that this player is a very intriguing story overall and also a draft pick. So I'm curious to see if and when he does get that Canadian citizenship. I would imagine that's probably going to happen in the future at some point. And if you are the Elks, it would behoove them to say, hey, if you don't get for the CFL draft, we'll make you a second, maybe even first round pick in the supplemental draft. And that gives the Elks a way of getting two kind of first overall picks, if you will, potentially in the supplemental draft, if you get them that way, you get a first overall pick kind of type talent for what the Elks are hoping is a discount in terms of where their pick could land in 2025. But I got to say, man, if the Elks continue picking number one overall, Chris Jones ain't going to be there making these picks even next year. And it should be noted, the Elks love playing Canadian players on their defensive line. They did it more than anybody last year outside of maybe the the Lions. This year they will, I'm sure, do it more than anybody given that Matthew Betts is in the NFL and they've got a bunch of Canadians going to their second and third years. So Alfano would be a good fit for them. They also lost A.C. Leonard, should be noted. Um, last one, boys. The final edition of the 2024 CFL Scouting Bureau rankings were released on Wednesday with Cincinnati linebacker Joel DeBlanco debuting at number six, Laval receiver Kevin Mattel being the highest riser, and Arkansas State linebacker Malik Straker being the lowest faller. JC, are these rankings to be taken seriously? Look, they're be, to be taken with a big grain of salt. I think at the very top end of the rankings, they're largely accurate. The top five or six, to me, I think are basically spot on accurate to, to how these players should be slotted. Once you get past that, there is always going to be some finagling by these scouts who have to submit these rankings. They don't want to submit their true uh, positional assessments for their own team. And I think it speaks bigger volumes to a player's stock how he's moving up or down the list at this stage versus where he is. You can see the guys that are dropping because of their combine performance. There's a few of them that, frankly, if I was doing a top 20 or a top 25, I wouldn't have on my list right now, but teams are keeping them on, just dropping them a few spots to maybe obfuscate the guys that they really like in their back pocket that would be in their top 20, but they hope other teams don't have as highly. I think it's guys like Daniel Johnson to me, uh, Anim Donkwa and, and Gabe Wallace, I think have fallen in a lot of people's minds. I also probably wouldn't have Del Duncan Busby that high. I think he's a good player, but probably not top 20 in my eyes. And then there's, there's guys that should be on this list, like a Ben LeBros, who I think from a talent perspective is absolutely a top 20 player. So don't take it as accurate. This isn't the order that people are going to come off the board, but there are things to be gleaned from a list of this nature. Hell no, it shouldn't be taken seriously, guys. I'm pretty sure <laughs> that in his draft year, Johnny Augustine was in the top 20 of the scouting bureau and then didn't even get drafted, okay? 
there are all kinds of games being played here by rival scouts and rightfully so you don't want to tip your hand at all but you know i really wish that there was a true representation of the top 20 because honestly it matters to the players and it creates this idea among the players that in augustine's case well i'm certainly going to get drafted if i'm a top 20 guy in the cfl's scouting bureau that i'm going to be a draft pick lo and behold he doesn't end up being a draft pick and yes he's gone on to have a productive career and been in the league for a while now but still going in it's a big dose of reality so i would like to create something i understand it's competitive but that would help these athletes actually realize their true rankings or just don't do it at all or tell the athletes not to pay attention to it and what's actually going on with it because it creates some unrealistic expectations I, I get where you're both coming from. I do think that there's value to this list because I think fans need the opportunity to glean information about who the top players are, right? These are players largely that CFL fans. Then come to 3 downnationcom and read John Hodge <laughs> and J.C. Abbott's rankings. Appreciate those are Appreciate real. that. Uh, but you are bang on. Johnny Augustine cracked the top 20 at number 17 back in 2017 and did go undrafted. Another famous example would be in the 2020 CFL draft, Cattell Assay, offensive lineman out of Laval, debuted at seven, rose to six, and in the final version of the rankings, fell to 11 and then was an eighth round pick, right? Um, so there are people who fill out ballots for and it's it's created by cfl talent evaluators who have every incentive to lie and no incentive to tell the truth that being said i do fully <laughs> agree with jc and that i think that the top half of these rankings are very legitimate one through ten some scouts are obviously going to have some players i got this guy at seven that guy at eight somebody comes along oh i got that guy at seven and this guy at nine okay fair enough we're splitting hairs at that point but are there players in the bottom half of these rankings who will not be top 20 picks in the CFL draft? Yes. And are there guys who will fall as late as round four, five, six? I believe the answer is also yes. Also, JC mentioned Ben LeBras. I think Ben LeBras will be a first round pick or a high second round pick. He is not on this list. The defensive back out of McGill. I also think George Una, offensive lineman out of Windsor, will be a first round pick. And he is not on this list, I think, by design with scouts trying to stash him and maybe hope that he falls a little bit lower. So, yes, I think the top half should be taken seriously, like the bottom half should not be taken seriously. And I'm looking forward to coming back the day after the draft. Draft is happening Tuesday, April 30th. We'll record a pod on Wednesday, May 1st and compare this list to how the picks rolled in. Because at least one of these guys is going to fall all the way down the board. Yeah, and let's be frank. It only takes one team, though, right? Because sometimes we'll look at it in, in retrospect and we'll say, oh, wow, I can't believe that guy went in the top 20. He was nowhere near these rankings. And every other team had a sixth-round Greg on him. Cough, cough, Cole Nelson. <laughs> well, it only takes one team. One team really likes you and they want to go and get you. Well, all of a sudden, you can come out of nowhere and be in that top 20. And if you're that type of guy, there is no way in hell that that scout is going to put you on their top 20 for the CFL. They're going to leave you off it intentionally because they don't want anyone else cluing into it. So those type of guys, it only takes one. That is a fair point. Should be noted that Nelson has had a much better career than at least two of the players taken ahead of him. So. As much as you bang on that him every week, fair. JC. Yeah, Cole Nelson and Regina. Didn't, didn't like, they go? <laughs> hey, they, they went uh, Elaine. Did they go Elaine uh, Pie in the second round of uh, that Edmonton? draft? Uh, yeah. Was that that draft or the I next draft? I think that draft? might be right. P uh, Elaine P Pie e was a 27 year old kid from the Czech Republic who hadn't played football in two years. And I think they that drafted rings a bell, him. Like a, but how do you how do you spell uh, it? Uh, a L A I N P A E. I'm not seeing it here. It, he won't have a Wikipedia no, I'm saying, like, page. I'm looking I at the draft like as a whole. Three games. He's not here. Okay, that must, must have been, have been the next year. year. But 
Boy, that's a that's a couple of off the wall picks and back to back. It seasons. was, but JC, you said he was from the Czech Republic. Are you sure he's a native of the Czech Republic, or did he visit Belgium for a week when he was eight? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, didn't he play at the University of Ottawa for a bit? If I remember right, yes, he did. And he, well, his dad moved to Canada, and then he went to play one year at the University of Ottawa, and then left the school. I don't. I think he didn't play for two years, but in that time, lived in Ottawa and got his citizenship, and then ran something ridiculous at, at a, like an individually filmed pro day, and uh, the Edmonton Elks fell in love with him. And then he was because we had the pandemic right after. I think he was twenty nine by the time he he played his first CFL game, uh, and hadn't played football in like four years. So that was not a great game. Yeah, I found him. 2020, so the year before, he was taken with a 13th okay. overall pick. But, I mean, in fairness, there were no good players picked after him. Like, immediately after him was Marc Antoine de Croix. He's been a bust. After him was Nathan Rourke. He's terrible. <laughs> so, like, really, it wasn't that bad of a pick. <laughs> really, when you think about it. Jeez. A, a, a true masterclass by Brock Sutherland. Yeah, he and Schaefer Baker and uh, Savros Katzentonis went two rounds later. But again, neither of those guys are good. Um, so really, we should uh, we should give the Edmonton their flowers. It wasn't that bad of a pick. <laughs> On this day, it's time for Hodges Heritage Moment. In 2015, Stephen Lambala retired from professional football at the age of 23. The Calgary product was the fifth overall pick in the 2013 CFL draft, which was considered too high by a number of pundits. This is what we're talking about, JC. He dressed for 15 games with the Montreal Alouettes over two seasons with the team, rushing for 23 yards before retiring to pursue a job in the oil and gas industry. As of 2020, according to his Wikipedia page, Lambala is an attorney, having graduated from the University of Moncton. Dunk, what do you remember of Lambala? Two things. One about him. He was an absolute beast for the University of Calgary Dinos. The other doesn't so much have to do with him as a person, but Jim Pop, I believe, traded up in that draft for Lambala. And everybody in CFL circles was absolutely stunned by it. The pick didn't work out. I don't think that was as much to do with Lombala because I feel like if he went to a different place where they developed him better and supported him better, that he could have been at least pretty good in the CFL. But going back to Cole Nelson, it just shows you on draft day some of the awful mistakes these teams can make versus some of the picks that work out to the degree of a Mark Antoine de Croix or Nathan Rourke or on down the list. Now this was about two years before I started following the draft closely. So I can't remember it personally, but is, is Steven that, Rowley's that is brother, yeah. right? That's I'm correct with that. I, I love those type of stories because clearly both were talented football players at the collegiate level. Roly had a much better on-field career, but Steven has been successful in his own right as a lawyer, and I don't think anyone would discount that in any way. You can take different paths to success in life as members of the same family. Roly Lombala was one of my favorite BC Lions growing up, an absolute beast. Of a I will – slight correction, Dunk, here. Edmonton – traded this pick to Montreal, but it wasn't Montreal trading up in the draft. Edmonton gave Montreal this pick in the 2013 draft because they really wanted to acquire Brody McKnight, the kicker who the oh. uh, Montreal Alouettes oh. had, uh, or, or sorry, I'm messing this up slightly. The third overall pick, which Montreal used on Mike Edom, very talented defensive back was acquired from Edmonton in exchange yeah. for the kicker Brody McKnight, who the Alouettes had inexplicably drafted in the first round two years previous. Two picks later, with their own pick, the Alouettes took Lumbala at five. So there was a trade, and yes, the Alouettes uh, made two of the top five picks, but it was not because they were trading up to take Lumbala. And one could argue they were happy to take Lumbala because they had two first round picks and they wanted to potentially change the ratio yeah. at Running back. That being said, in hindsight, probably the Alouettes should not have taken Brody McKnight in the first round. And they also probably should not have taken 
Stephen Lamballa in the first round, though, obviously, his brother Raleigh was a monster, and Lamballa did have a great U Sports career. So, time for the three minute drill. Thanks for that correction, buddy. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers posted a $5.7 million operating profit in 2023 after leading the CFL in attendance for the second straight year. Is that positive news for fans in Bomberland? I think it is, and I think the Bombers are being really smart here. When the going's good, they are taking this money and reinvesting it into what is now Princess Auto Stadium and a bunch of other amenities because obviously this gravy train will come to a close at some point. This team is not going to continue selling games out and leading the league in attendance forever, but by building their nest egg and investing now into their building, that will set them up really well for, again, inevitably the day when this is no longer the hottest ticket in the CFL. The Montreal Alouettes will wear throwback uniforms when they host the Edmonton Elks in August to honor their 50th anniversary of the 1974 Grey Cup. Are you excited to see how they look? I am absolutely ecstatic. I love me a good throwback, boys, especially to a bygone era from CFL history. I grew up being regaled of stories of the great rivalries in Grey Cups between Montreal and Edmonton. To me, this is a perfect way to celebrate one of those games. Former 1,000-yard CFL receiver Stephen Dunbar Jr. has been waived by the UFL. Do you think we could see him back north of the border in 2024? It's possible, fellas, but part of the reason he went down to the UFL in the first place is because he wasn't getting the type of CFL money that he wanted. So if he's going to come back north of the border, it's going to have to be on a bargain deal for the team that does potentially sign Dunbar Jr. Hodge, Canadian offensive lineman Kyle Hergel told you that he could have done 35 to 37 reps on the bench press at his Boston College Pro Day had he not elected to stop at 30. Do you believe Yes, him? I do, because if you watch the video, it's clear he was not maxing out. Uh, I think he did this in the interest of not risking injury. And honestly, 30, I think, is high enough of a number that teams no longer particularly care how many you can do. If you can do 30, you've proven you're a beast. It doesn't matter how much of a beast you are. You've achieved beast status. And uh, Kyle Hergel, I think, will get an NFL opportunity, not just because of these numbers, but because of how good he is, truly. Legendary equipment manager Gordon Red Batty has retired following a 50-year career in the CFL and NFL. How will you remember him? Well, I think there's two different ways you can remember him. One is by his accomplishments, which is two Grey Cup rings and two Super Bowl rings as an equipment manager. That is a ridiculous career by any standards. But I also think it's fun to think back to how he started and remember him that way. Because that's a kid who in 1973, at 13 years old, hopped the fence at the old Autostad to sneak into the Montreal Alouette Stadium, was not a football fan at the time, but just wanted to play around with his friends, got caught by the GM, who forced him to clean out gutters for a year as punishment, and then... He just had a 50-year career off of that. That is an all-time great football story. John Ryan returned to Seattle on Tuesday to sign a one-day contract and officially retire as a member of the Seahawks. How will you remember his tenure in the NFL? He was a great punter. That's obvious. But the moment that everybody's got to remember, 2014 NFC Championship game, fake (laughs) field goal, floats a pass on the run while rolling to his left, fellas. He's a right-handed thrower to offensive tackle Gary Gilliam. Like, what an unbelievable play to happen in a game of that magnitude. That the comeback. I will remember John Ryan's career as a Seattle Seahawks. The Ottawa Red Blacks finally announced their football operations staff for the 2024 season. Did any of the names surprise you? No, because these moves were made three months ago and everybody knew what they were. So, (laughs) A, I was not surprised. (laughs) But then, B, I was also not surprised to see the team make some changes to their scouting staff. I don't think that the Red Blacks over the last couple of years have brought in enough raw talent from the States. 
I'm hopeful for their sake that the new regime will do a better job of bringing in a higher caliber of player directly from the States, which should be easier now, now that we're down to one spring league. Legendary NFL running back Marshawn Lynch was at a Wednesday, uh, pardon me, a Winnipeg Jets game on Tuesday night supporting the Seattle Kraken, a team he part owns. JC, what would you do if you saw beast mode at an NHL game? I... I don't know what I would do. I'd be a, a little bit starstruck, to be entirely honest. I, Of all the places he could have traveled with the teams, he could have gone to Vegas. He could have gone to Toronto. He could have gone to New York City. Why the heck was Beast Mode making the trip? It's a destination a city. <laughs> hey, I know Marshawn is a unique individual uh, I question. And that by the way, JC, choice. Marshawn Lynch was born in Oakland, California, but it should be noted he lived in Buffalo for many years when he played for the Bills, <laughs> and he also lived in Seattle for many years when he played with the Seahawks. Just because I didn't want to not <laughs> give our listeners the full scope <laughs> of everything he's ever experienced in his life, so I just wanted to note that for you. <laughs> Canadian QB Christian Villa has entered the transfer portal again following a one-year stint at the University of Pittsburgh. Where do you think he could end up next season? Dude, if I knew, I would go and print a lottery ticket for myself because I think there's all kinds of potential here in Christian Veyu, but he hasn't found the program that believes in him to the degree that he and his family believe in his skills as a quarterback. I really hope he finds a program that sees his upside because he's been a guy for a while now. It seems like he's been in the NCAA for almost too long at this point that can be a productive starting quarterback in the NCAA, but he's got to find that right fit for it to potentially happen. On that note, we thank you as always for listening to the Three Down Nation podcast. We'll see you next Wednesday for our last episode before the draft. Should be a good one.